Good afternoon, everyone. Hope all of you are uh, gaining knowledge and heading forward. Okay. And today's topic is something very important because this is where everyone will have queries. Is this right? Am I doing the right thing? So many of those such issues will be clarified and hopefully at the end of the session. Okay. Next slide. Am I audible? Yeah, ma'am. Very good. Thank you. Okay. So we have got next, what are our learning objectives for today? Number one we would discuss the transitions in an illness trajectory of any life-limiting illness, then explain the principles of biomedical ethics and the application in end-of-life care. Then also explain the existing legal, legal provisions and national level policies that facilitate the end-of-life care provision and discuss concepts like limitation of life-sustaining treatment, do not attempt resuscitation, futility of care, withholding and withdrawing treatment. And also, last but not the least, very important thing is advanced care planning. Okay, so let's go into things one at a time and uh, discuss in detail. See, the first thing was transition in chronic illness. So what happens? when someone is diagnosed or labeled with any disease, how does it transform is what we are going to see. So basically, for example, when a, we'll take a simple example of any chest disease. Uh, for example, someone is uh, a heavy smoker or known to have asthma. So initially what happens is they have the disease. First, they may not know that they're having the disease and then they will get into a phase of diagnosing what their issue is once their symptoms become more obvious. And then what happens? So they get diagnosed, start having treatment and uh, they may initially find very good response. Then it will be going on for some time. And then the disease nature, that's what is the trajectory or the transition, it changes from a situation or state where it was well controlled. Suddenly, slowly it gets to a stage where the control is not as what the patient would expect. So that is when slowly decompensation is set to set in. And then initial stage of decompensation they may need more medications or hospitalization. So if you see in the picture, uh, you have a red thing mentioning time. That is the progress or the progression of the disease. And as it progresses, if you see in the graph, there are some dips. Okay. So those dips may be acute on chronic presentations. As I was mentioning about any chest, they could have an acute exacerbation of an asthma or an acute exacerbation of their COPD. So all those dips, if you see, each dip when they have, next time when they get better, they may not be the same as they were before. So that is how you see the slow decline. So then I said initial is decompensation. Then next phase is when the decompensation increases, dependency. Basically, they may not be able to do what they were doing before by themselves. Next, the same symptom, breathlessness, which was managed with one inhaler becomes needing. It might get to a stage where it may need two or three inhalers, two or three times in a day. So their dependency on the medicine increases. So that, that is further progression of the disease. And then they may get to a stage where decline or terminal illness means where they are unable to cope. 
even with the medications, with all modes of management, still there is not adequate or sufficient response to the medications that they would have anticipated. Or maybe they had the same medication and got better relief, but now they are unable to get that relief. And then finally, they get into a stage where they are unable to cope. The body gives up and they end die. So this is what is the transition. So in that picture, if you see, on top of the time line, you have an area where you see the diagnosis and palliative care mentioned there. See, diagnosis, initial phase, what it is, is the query. That is where... Ideally, palliative care, you've had few sessions on palliative care. Palliative care is best delivered when it is started early in the phase. So that is what is mentioned in this picture also. When it is started early, both the patient and the physician are able to deliver maximum benefit. So that is what is uh, diagrammatically represented in this. Next slide. In this slide, as we saw the trajectory of the illness, here what you're going to see is, these are the proposed trajectories of dying. What are the common modes? What happens in the overall population is what is depicted in this picture. Okay. The first one, if you see, is there a marker? Uh, I use this most. Thank you. With this, I move. Just use this itself. Okay. How do I get the other the things off? Yes. Okay. Basically, if you see in this graph, uh, the first one, what is mentioned as sudden death. So if you see, I'm pointing their general, uh, the, um, you see function on one axis and uh, time on the other axis. So the function or their basic functionality is quite high. This, a good example for this is like someone who is fit and well, doing everything by themselves and they have a very good quality of life, fully active. They could have something like a, accident or it could be sudden massive cardiovascular collapse. So those type of uh, group of population, if you see, their general efficiency is quite high. That is where they are. Oh. Okay. So you see their normal functional functionality is very good and suddenly the functionality is they're going on doing everything, but suddenly it's like a total drop. As I said, cardiovascular collapse, cardiorespiratory collapse are a common example for this. And it is said that only five to seven or maximum 10% of population only will have this type of trajectory of dying. And very good example is uh, Dr. Abdul Kalam, who was actively speaking, doing everything, and suddenly he collapsed and died. So the number of people facing or having this type of death is very small. Then the next graph, what you see is terminal illness. A very good example for that would be cancer, oncology, or any such uh, malignant illness. This is said as waterfall effect. So again, if you see their general activity is quite high, they are able to do everything. Once their diagnosis is made, from that point, their efficiency, which was high, drops down to uh, low in a short period of time. So this is called as a waterfall effect. And in this category, roughly 15 to 20% of the population can fall into this. And the third one, this is something very important for all of us to understand because this is what organ failure is mentioned. Any system failure, 
be it cardiovascular, respiratory, renal, liver, neuro, any system, someone who has an extensive systemic disease will have this type of presentation. If you see their general performance itself in the other two words you saw was high. Their general performance itself is lower than what it should be for that corresponding a group of population. And on top of that, every time they have one episode of illness. If you see, each episode of illness brings their activity performance down. Okay, with treatment, they do come up. They do come up, but again, if you see, they don't come up to the level where they were. They are slightly lower. So that is one episode. If they have another episode, another bout of infection for a person who has COPD or asthma. So what does that do? It brings down their, they again recover. But even when they are fully back to normal, if you see, if you extrapolate it to their function, see from their baseline function, they are below. Like this, each episode, they, they may recover but their performance or functionality goes down each time and it is never even up to the mark to what they were at that time of admission. See, for example, if you see each time, it starts and goes down. It starts here. This is the beginning of, after the second episode. So after that episode, again, it goes down and it doesn't come back to what it was at that time of admission. So this is something to be kept in mind. Any, any systemic disease, be it any system, this is what, this the responsibility lies with us to explain this to the patient and family. So and nearly 50% of the population will come under this category. Then the last one is frailty, uh, in which you see, Elderly, 80, 90 year old, 100 year old, those people will fall in this category and their function is quite low to start off and it will be a very, very gradual decline. Okay, so basically this graph or this slide is very important and uh, hope all of you have got some idea of what it is. If anyone wants any clarification, I don't mind doing it once again, or explain anything. If anyone has any queries, please do ask. Okay, if there are no queries, I will move forward. Next slide. Okay, now we'll come on to the important, as we said, what are the important elements of ethics? So you see, these are the four cardinal principles of medic medical ethics. First one is autonomy. Second one is beneficence. Third one is non-malfeasance. And then last is justice. Okay. These are the four pillars, what we say. To do or maintain or upkeep all these four pillars, you have some more important things also to be kept in mind. What are they? Truth telling. Conveying the truth is our responsibility and it has to be done even though it is difficult. Okay. And next to our respect for life and respect for the person within. You see someone, you there is you may think someone has some disease, but there is a person underlying uh, when you see a patient. So that also has to be kept in mind. Next slide. So the other things which were mentioned were you have to maintain dignity, maintain honesty. To maintain, as I said, to tell the truth and things, these are the characteristics or nature which has to be had to, to convey the message. Now we'll go ahead and see all these cardinal principles with examples of 
case histories because that will make things clear. This is what all of you will be having in mind. And once you see that, that may be more helpful. Here we have got a 78 year old woman with stroke, hypertension and type two diabetes uh, who is cachectic, bed bound and dependent on all activities of daily living. She's brought into the hospital with reduced urinary output and reduced oral intake also. Along with that, she's diagnosed with a urinary tract infection and end-stage renal disease. What's the advice given? She's advised antibiotics and dialysis. All these are the information given. But what does the patient want? Patient refuses any, any sort of treatment while the sons want her to undergo dialysis. So this is the scenario. What is that? What would be your opinion? What is that all of, like either you can uh, type in a chat or um, raise your hand or unmute and speak. Ma'am, patient has autonomy to decide, make uh, her own decisions. So if she is refusing, then we have to uh, accept that she's refusing and we document that patient has refused for dialysis. Uh, very good. good. Good way of explaining. Anybody else agrees with this or anybody else disagrees with what? Uh, what yeah. Yeah. Uh. Yes, ma'am. I totally agree. It's a patient decision. Hmm. Very good. So anyone disagree? No, no. I will, uh, I will go with the son and I will ask her to have dialysis only. Is anyone of that opinion? Never mind, because better to clarify things now rather than have queries and doubts later. We can clarify the advantages or disadvantages of their decision. But last decision is patient or their family members. Exactly. One important thing underlying this is it is our responsibility and duty to explain the risk, benefit, pros and cons of everything. What will happen if you have the treatment? What will happen if you don't have the treatment? So everything in detail has to be explained to the patient. Okay, next slide. This is what in detail we'll see next. Exactly what we asked. Will you advise the patient and cause her to have dialysis? Will you avoid talking and don't tell anything or don't talk to the Either you talk to the patient or talk to the family, like one-way one, one -way traffic, will you do? Or will you respect the patient's wishes? Or will you refer her, oh, no, no, I, I can't manage, I will send her somewhere. So all these options will be going through everyone's mind. But what is that will be done and what is best to do is what. Okay, next slide. So here, in this to, ana to analyze, analyze and see what is right. So who makes the decision? Just because the doctor is the senior or authoritative person, does the doctor have the upper hand? Or the family who are looking after her, do they have? Or in, these are the dilemmas which always everyone will be having. So what shall I do? Uh, I, shall I go with the family who have brought the patient? Okay. So that is where, as I said, we have to assess whether the patient understands, whether the patient can comprehend. Whatever I am telling, the patient should understand. For example, I'm telling the patient knows only Hindi. I talk full only English. And patient nods the head. So is that right to take that the patient has understood everything? No, okay, what I was trying to say was we have to make sure the patient understands in complete context. So for this, what we can do is we can explain and ask the patient to tell in her own words what she understood so that we also are sure that the patient has understood and then document. Okay. So, and also we should be able to tell in simple words so that the patient understands. We have to tell, if we, for example, for this patient, 
if we do dialysis, what will happen? If we don't do dialysis also, what will happen? She may have more symptoms. She may have more pain. She may have more urinary retention. All that is our duty to tell. So everything has to be conveyed. And also we have to have a plan. Like see, what are the goals of care? So when we decide on not having dialysis, so we also have to say what happens next? What will we do for her? What will we not be able to do? Everything has to be discussed with the patient and family. Those are the goals of care. And then document. And prior to that, what that's what is given in the left. Does the patient have decision-making capacity? That is what is that's what I said as whether the patient understands, whether the patient is able to comprehend, understand, and reply back in simple words. So this is our duty. And finally, patient has the total decision making uh, power. So that is what is conveyed by autonomy. Okay, next slide. So, for making a correct decision, no, we have to have a good relationship. If, you're, for example, you're seeing the patient first time, you don't know the patient at all, that time expecting these type of situations may be a bit difficult. So, that is why you, the patient should have faith and trust with the doctor. So, that happens either with few consultations or many times it may be a family physician whom they are seeing regularly. So in those situations, uh, it will be easy and it will be of much ease both to the physician and the patient to make decision and express their wishes clearly. Okay. And a uh, few important uh, things to be kept in mind is we have to maintain confidentiality and patient privacy. Whatever the patient wishes and in her best interest, if she says you don't tell anybody else, it is our duty and responsibility. Confidentiality is also an important part of our medical ethics. So, and then truth telling. So, we have to tell the truth in a way. See, empathetic truth telling. We have to understand uh, what's the difference between sympathy and empathy. Anyone can uh, say? Emotional support with the ethical principles we call empathy. And emotional support in personal ways called sympathy. Ah, a little bit fine tuning, Aldo. Thank you very much. Sympathy is just compassion or you feeling sorry just for them. Okay. That is sympathy. You feel you have compassion, consideration. That is sympathy because of their situation. Empathy is you yourself putting yourself in their shoes. For example, uh, if someone is going through some difficulty, you say, I can understand. I can see what are your problems are. And so you putting yourself in their situation and being considerate, that is empathy. Exactly as, you, as she has mentioned. So this difference has to be understood. So that is what empathetic, empathetic truth telling means. You have to tell the truth in such a way you are you put yourself also in that patient situation. How she will take, he or she, how they will take. They have to understand. Are they in the right mind frame to understand? Considering all this, you tell the truth still because telling the truth is the most important thing. Okay, so you have to make sure they will be comfortable, situation, time, everything is right and then convey. Then next is, uh, uh, the other things are, you. as I was already telling, you have to give all information, both the plus and minus of treat, uh, not having the treatment. And you have to also consider the regional, cultural beliefs, whatever they have. Okay, that has to be. Last, what is mentioned is collective autonomy. See, there is a big difference in what type of family, what region each one is from. So we have to give due respect for it and also maintain an autonomy. For example, collective autonomy. So they may be a they may be willing to make a collective decision. 
still patient is the person deciding but she will say i will uh, i will uh, inform my very close family and collectively we will make fine that that is the norm of each area no in uh, some areas that is what is their religious or cultural belief means we have to give due respect for that also okay next slide so this is just many many options are there we have to uh, give exact uh, thing and uh, uh, autonomy has a uh, upper hand that is what is explained you, once you explain everything and then the patient makes the decision that is called as informed consent you have told all the risks risks and benefit and then the decision is made next slide again here this one the doctor may be a person who is uh, giving uh, next slide it, there is something come below that also uh, so it is always even though we are we may be the, the not we the doctor may be a knowledgeable person he may know more than the patient all that may be there but the final our duty is to explain final decision making lies in the hands of the patient and that has to be done at all costs next slide okay this was when the patient is understanding everything fine okay the same scenario but the patient has dementia. What I'm telling, the patient is nicely laughing and smiling. But for last six months, she does not know where she is. She does not know her name. She does not know her address. Nothing she knows. But she is very like pleasantly confused, we say. A, a person you, whom you see may be like that. So in those situations, what happens? What do we do? Anyone wants to contribute? Okay, next slide. Okay, so then comes, in this scenario, what I've said, okay, the patient cannot make the decision. Then we have to find out, okay, is there anyone who is going to work or act in the best interest of the patient? Like, next of kin means, could be a son, daughter, blood relative, or she has already, he or she has already nominated someone or there is someone who is always going to act in their in best interest. So there, once the situation gets to a stage where the patient is unable, is not in a situation to make decision, you go to step B and see what all I've said. Then step C, already the patient has thought, okay, it's when uh, these type of things are happening globally now, they themselves, because we don't know how our life will take us. So they, there is something called as a living will or power of attorney. What does that mean? They've already written, written and kept. Today I am all right. Someday down the line, I may not be okay. And that time a situation may come where these type of decision, do I need this? Do I know, need that? What type of treatment shall I have? All that decision when the need comes, I may not be able to do that. So, anticipating that, I'm writing a living will and keeping. If something goes wrong, do not resuscitate or do not attempt reviving me. Do not give this type of treatment or do, do not feed, force feed me. Do not put NG2. You can put all, document all these things and write and keep. So, that is what is called as a living will. Or next option is, uh, I may not be, I uh, I give power of attorney to like the previous box, you have next of kin. I can designate someone who will be responsible to take decisions on my behalf. So these are things which have to be seen into. If you are having a patient or person in front of you who is not able to make the decision. So this is what has to be kept in mind. Okay, next slide. So as we saw, beneficence means doing good. That is what is beneficence. And always that is done in the best interest of the patient. Okay. So in that next, 
Next is beneficial. So whatever you do should be in the best interest of the patient only. So in that case, you'll see, I'm a, I will try to correct something which can be correctable. And then you have to see what is the disease? Is the disease correctable? Sometimes there are some things which can be corrected, some things which cannot be corrected. So that differentiation has to be there. Then next important thing is risk-benefit ratio. You have to see what are the risks, what are the benefits. And weighing both what is best for the patient. Okay, so that is what. And then next is, am I simply delaying the inevitable? So you have to do something in the best interest of the patient. In those, in having that in mind, you cannot delay the inevitable. By that, what is meant? By delaying the inevitable, you're causing harm to the patient. Whereas from the beginning, we are telling, we should do good to the patient. So that is what? So for that, what you know, for knowing that, you should know what are the prognosis or prognosticating factors. What will happen if this treatment continues? What is the general outcome or the general statistical figure of someone who has this treatment? In this condition, these are all evidence-based medicine. All information and data is available. So with that, you see and go through medical information to know if such treatment is followed, what will happen? If not, what will happen? So those are the prognosticators. We have got a patient with all these conditions. If she has treatment, also she may not improve. That is what you get. So in that condition, what you should do, you should do something in the best interest of the patient and not just carry on and delay her inevitable or delay her suffering. Okay, that is what is mentioned here. Next slide. So for this, we have another case history, which we will see. Here we have got a 20-year-old boy with metastatic osteosarcoma of the lower end of femur. He also has lung metastasis and anemia. He has a large tumor on his thigh and he is insisting that he wants operation. He wants to get that tumor out. Okay. And the parents and patient, everyone is very clear. No, we want only operation. We, we don't want this big swelling. It's very uncomfortable for him. But what you also have to have in mind, the first statement, 20-year-old boy, metastatic CA, lung metastasis and anemia also, okay? Having all this in mind, what should the surgeon do? What? Ma'am, surgeon, uh, ma surgeon would firstly tell them the complications as he's having lung metastasis, he might develop respiratory complication after the operation and yeah. he's also anemic, so he'll develop a... a uh, obviously, metabolic uh, complications also after operation. So, doctor, surgeon has to first uh, tell them the risk factors and explain them very nicely so that they can understand the risk factors and then ask them to make some decision. Exactly. Very good. Thank you very much. So, here the responsibility of the doctor is to explain. Explain in simple terms. See, for them... The tumor is a big one. So they are thinking they will try to help the boy and the boy also thinks because of this big tumor, he may not be able to mobilize. Okay, so that is why he would have thought if that goes off, maybe I'll be all right. But the responsibility of the doctor is, is there by doing this, uh, is there any risk for his life? What is given there? It is metastatic, lung metastasis. And it's a major surgery. He will have he will need major anesthesia. Will he withstand all that? And anemia, big tumor you take, already he's anemic. Blood loss, will he cope? So what are the risks of him dying rather than uh, surviving after the surgery? So all those have to be said in, in clear explanation. Because as uh, Jagruti said, uh, lung metastasis, so already lung is not okay, will he withstand anesthesia? And then anemia, so another big blood loss, will he cope? So all these have to be explained to the patient and the parents and then give some time and see what is, what is that they will ask after all our explanation. Okay, so that is what the surgeon should do. Next slide. 
So here comes, uh, next is, as I said, risk benefit. What are the benefit of doing? What are the harm of doing? So here, the third point of ethics comes in. So I said beneficence is do good. Non-malficence is do no harm. So if he is having so much, see, uh, what are all mentioned uh, under harm? Anemia, anesthesia, pain. So those two, anemia and anesthesia only, I gave the explanation. Okay, metastasis, having anesthesia, will he cope? Then anemia, because he's already anemic, large tumor, more blood loss, how will he manage that? So those are the uh, things which has to be explained under harm. So we should do good and we should not do any harm. So that is what is mentioned here. Next. So this is what here is basically we are trying to say, explain, as we said, explain medical history, what all, and we, whenever we are telling, we have to give with clear clinical evidence. So they also will uh, understand and uh, abide with the doctor. Okay, next slide. So if there is any conflict also, we have to explain, come to terms. Whenever there is conflict, you have to explain to each person separately and then combine both of them also and convey the message. Because each one may be having or having conflict mainly in the best interest out of love and affection or to make sure that the other person is comfortable. So initially explain to them separately and then get both of them on board and explain and then the conflict also will resolve. Okay, next one. So, uh, first thing, you know, whenever these type of situations arise, our main job is do no harm. Okay, as I said, that's why I was trying to explain, when you do all this, is there any risk to his life? Because that may not come to the patient's mind or the parent's mind. Because for them at that point of time, uh, getting rid of the issue or getting rid of the problem. Okay. So then that is the right of the non malpeasants or doing no harm is also a right of the physician. And that is what has to be kept. When we come to any situation like this, you have, uh, the fourth point what's given there is, Doctrine of double effect. Okay. So here I would just like to say um, whenever, when we do some things, there may be two effects. One good and one bad. But they coexist. An example, uh, we normally say two examples. Um, one is where if you are using midazolam, like to calm the patient, Sometimes it may cause, if it is given in higher dose or something, it may cause a little bit of respiratory depression. And another example I normally say is a mother who has an ectopic pregnancy in the fallopian tube. Fallopian tube has to be taken off. But that may impair her fertility. So in these type of situations, two effects happen. But the intention, uh, I will explain with both the examples that I gave. For the midazolam, my main intention to allay anxiety and calm the patient. My intention is not to stop him from breathing. Okay. Similarly, with the ectopic pregnancy, if I know if this gynecologist or uh, gynecologist doesn't remove the uh, ectopic, that ruptured tube, the mother will die. Taking away the tube and causing infertility is not the main intention of the gynecologist. So these are all double effect. The main intention is good. The effect, one good effect and one side effect or the result of the first action may not be good, but it is not done intentionally. That is what is called as doctrine of double effect. Okay, a treatment intended for good unintentionally causes harm. Okay, is that clear? 
because this is something very very important because every very many times you may have doubt in this oh can i do this because that effect is also happening there what is your intention the two examples that i gave are they clear anyone like i'll just give a minute or so if anyone has, because this is something very many times people have doubt oh why should we do this when it has got so the intention is important and the unintentional harm is just a co happening of that anyone wants to ask or disagrees or wants more explanation please uh, like type or unmute and ask or do something excuse me ma'am uh, ma'am i have a doubt uh, not related to doctrine of double effect but just a doubt uh, you, as you said that we now practice evidence based practice we use so uh, while explaining to the uh, like for example the last case scenario mm -hmm. uh, while the surgeon is explaining he for showing him some evidence what can be used what can he say he should use some example of previous patient or something yeah, like Ah, see, see, mostly no, like an orthopedic surgeon, 10, 15 years of uh, experience he's doing. He would have had similar cases in the past or there is clinical evidence on um, from uh, review article journals. This is what is the medical outcome. Uh, like many studies Number have shown. Hmm. Uh, if he is telling the uh past patient history or something that he is also breaking confidentiality of that patient? No, no, no. You don't reveal one patient uh, thing like that. Again, this is medical information. You are not going to tell such and such patient from this place, from this address. Like that and all you are not you going have to, to just see. tell the case history, not the patient. Yes. No, no. Uh, okay. this, this more so, it is statistical figures. Like see, for example, if 100 people like who all have uh, situations like you and if they have this surgery the outcome 80 percent have not made it so these are all review articles these are all uh, uh, literature information is there that is how evidence-based medicine what you say is you see from the medical evidences present in the literature there are studies there are um, randomized control studies uh, observational studies like that all these are information available in the literature that or like from for example if a doctor is a senior person he's practiced for 15-20 uh, years his own practice he need not label and name and shame we say we don't name and shame patients okay but he can say in my 15 years of service I have seen at least 50-60 patients of your type if we see they don't withstand the surgery so that is why we are recommending this on medical grounds not on any personal grounds is that clear yes ma'am yes ma'am thank you ma'am welcome, welcome better see many times what i say uh, that's why no one should hesitate to ask questions one person asked questions eight or nine people also would have had that same question in mind but would have been hesitant to ask so one person asks, it's in the benefit of the whole team or group. Okay, that's important. So that is what, so these things are quite important uh, to understand, uh, go back and read these stuff and then make sure it's clear. That's the important. Next. So uh, the non-malfeasance overrides autonomy even. For example, in this, we saw that the boy wanted surgery. Okay. That's what non-malfeasance overrides autonomy means. Autonomy is the boy's wish. Boy's wish was to have surgery. So now I say autonomy and then go ahead and do surgery and something harm comes to the boy. What is that right? So non-malfeasance is doing no harm. So I will tell him. In, in his best interest so that no harm is done to him. That is why I am not allowing your wish to go forward. Even though I respect your wish, but my duty will fail if I go ahead and do. Because if the outcome is not going to be good and if I have not told you, when, because when you explain all this, they may immediately say, 
oh, is it so? I did not know all this. In that case, I will manage. Now you give me something for pain relief. The same patient or person who wanted surgery, when you explain, may turn back and tell what I'm telling. Eight out of 10 times when you say that is what will happen because they would not have known. Okay, is that clear? That's what is written in the line below. Next slide. So this is what um, we have seen. Um, what is, uh, it should be, the action should be morally good and you must not desire any bad effect. The good effect must be as immediate as the negative effect. So here intention and uh, thing is more important. Next. So next one, a 57 year old man with advanced metastatic cancer of the lung. He's severely breathless. Mainly why? Because of his disease progressing. As we saw in the first, second slide, his disease has gone to a stage where no medication, nothing is responding. Okay. All reversible causes of dyspnea has been ruled out. So they have completely uh, discussed and seen. Is there infection? Is there any correctable cause? All they've seen, nothing is there. So he is now admitted to ICU for artificial ventilation. What do you think? What, what, what should happen? How do we go forward from here? Please give your opinions. What are right, wrong? Never mind. Is he a candidate for ventilation? That is the question. Okay, to make this uh, more clearer, I'll tell you another. This patient history you've got, okay? I'm going to tell another 25-year-old, fit and well, some uh, engineer working very well, hardworking. He's a uh, breadwinner of the family. He's got pneumonia. And he is also, like he's breathless, having high fever, history, two days history of pneumonia. He is the other patient. This 57-year-old, what history you've got? And that 27-year-old with what history I'm telling, both have come. There is only one bed. And uh, who is the person to be ventilated? Why? 27-year-old. Pardon me? I'm 27 years old patient with pneumonia. Uh, why? Ma'am, because he's the only breadwinner. If we uh, compare both the cases, he needs more attention and priority. Is that the only reason? In that case, I can make this 57 year old also as breadwinner. That is not a big. Uh, that. Ma'am, also, we have tried all the reversible causes. Uh, Ah, causes of is, see. yeah in this patient but we haven't tried anything in that patient so first we will go with that patient because the chances of survival is more with that patient that should be the reason okay what is correctable if anything see pneumonia in a 27 year old is if you give antibiotic he may respond and improve and uh, the thing is that futility where you can have a, I said, what, what evidence and prognostication. If there is evidence that 27-year-old, because generally, as I said, no, all these are statistical figures. Generally, 27-year-old, if you give IV antibiotic, put them on ventilator for two days, they may have a positive outcome. Because there we have a correctable condition in, our, in front of our hands. Whereas in this 57-year-old, Metastatic lung CA, already breathless, progressive disease, all reversible causes ruled out. The outcome possibility is what you have to see. Okay. That is the important factor which helps in decision making. Okay. So next. Exactly what? Um, go ahead. Next one. So what questions I asked only are there. So here... Important things. Why? Why am I making these decisions? It's again in the best interest of everyone. It's not a selfish decision made. That is what has to be practiced again and again. 
train we have to train people to practice in this way see healthcare is a scarce resource the whole world it is not any one part of the world whole world is making a hue and cry that healthcare cost is hitting the roof many reasons are there for that okay aging population increased population healthcare itself is expensive you compare any other industry healthcare is the most expensive industry so healthcare itself is a scarce resource an equitable access to resources you have to make justice in whatever you use and next is are we allocating that important precious resource in a just way that is why i gave that example of a 27 year old see that 27 year both many play many times they may be the breadwinner but by using for example any intensive care bed if you take it has some cost attached to that okay for example if you take in india and all somewhere 70000 to 1 lakh is one day cost of uh, someone who is intubated ventilated so am i using that 1 lakh cost in a wise way or i use that cost for a patient who will never recover and i waste 10 days on it is that whose ever money it is private money government money whatever it is isn't it our responsibility to use it wisely if that 10 lakhs was there will it not be useful for someone who deserves it so that is what is meant by the word justly so every time you have to make sure it is used properly so last fourth point is more important are we considering the family resources already they have very uh, minimal amount of money you are going to make that money be spent on a uh, non futile patient can will never recover is in such a state this 57 year old whom we saw will not be able to come out of the ventilator even if you put him on a ventilator so there you go spent and lakhs is that a worthwhile expenditure are you not draining the family's resource what they have that family may have still some living people after this person passes away so are we considering the family resources and is that being used properly that is also to be considered okay and, and what is mentioned on in the other boxes ethics is knowing the difference between what you have a right to do and what is right to do okay that's what see i can do but is it the right thing that i am doing just because i know to put a patient on a ventilator should i go ahead and do that is what is mentioned there in that box so uh, this session as that as such no will touch into each one's personality because that is also someone has to be a true genuine person for them ethics is is inbuilt in them and everyone has to have this inbuilt even we can develop all these qualities also so that is the important bit so justice is also equally important that's why all these four things are said as four pillars if one pillar falls will the roof stay so all four pillars are equally important okay next slide so that's what it is fair allocation uh the, these are some figures given end of life care consumes 10 to 12 percent of all health care expenditures uh, and is physicians duty to an individual patient and to society as a whole sometimes we may conflict in cases in which limited resources are disproportionately consumed by a critically ill individual for this only i've given enough examples uh what is mentioned in this only i had men mentioned through examples which will make things more clearer so assessing futility then becomes imperative so in, whether it's a futile or a non futile attempt is what has to be kept in mind next slide so next thing is that where treatment is going to be useful you have to give you just don't do aggressive treatment and empty their resources just because facilities are available okay next slide 
So next is what is the uh, difference between withholding and withdrawing? Okay. See, sometimes you may get to a stage. You are trying all treatment options. Uh, but in spite of that, five days, six days they've tried, no change, no improvement at all. In fact, patient is deteriorating. Okay, in those situations, a collective explanation has to be done. And you have to say, because there is no positive outcome, then withholding, withdrawing, both mean the same. So what you're doing, you're not doing further additional treatment. You're stopping there itself. That is what is withholding or withdrawing. So you, for example, antibiotic you were giving, no response at all. Same culture done, same, it's still like that. So it, there you stop. So that is what, that stopping is the same thing only is said when it is said as withholding or withdrawing. Withholding is not giving. Withdrawing is coming out of it. So just these are English words. Both mean the same. Okay. Uh, then next is cardiopulmonary resuscitation. That is what is when we saw do not resuscitate. That means sometimes you may be in a situation where resuscitation may not give a positive outcome. It will. It is waste doing it. So those situations where the decision is made not to go ahead and resuscitate. So that again is depend, it's again a medical decision, completely cardiac failure, uh, ejection fraction 10. So even if you resuscitate, will the patient be able to regain consciousness? What would you think? Regaining consciousness will next to be impossible there. So those situations, it may not be wise to go ahead and do resuscitation. Then legality in all this, no, it depends on your documentation. Okay. Uh, when, when you're seeing these type of patients, all your documentation has to be very clear. Not only your documentation, what you explain to the family, what explanation is given to the patient. So you have to document in the notes and tell this decision, discussion was done, this decision was made. Patient also agreed, patient and family explained who is that family means who, whether son, daughter, husband, wife, everything has to be mentioned and written. Next slide. So once it is all mentioned and uh, written, it is all legal. So no need to worry at all. Then next query is what is euthanasia? This again, oh, by doing this, is this euthanasia? No. Euthanasia refers to intentional act of ending a patient's life. Okay. By medical means at the request of patient or family. Okay. Again, they may say to allay suffering, but it's an intentional action. It's a uh, active work. Euthanasia is never passive. So that is the big difference to understand. And it is illegal in India. So that should never be done. And uh, withholding and withdrawing life support for a patient who has terminal illness is not euthanasia. So there it is not an intentional act of killing someone. You're just stopping giving treatment and then nature takes its time. You may withdraw treatment and patient may live for 10 days, 15 days, one month also. So you're not hastening anything. As we saw in this last 40 minutes, you're not doing something to hasten death. You're just stopping the support or treatment and then nature takes its course. We don't actively do anything. So this is one big difference to be understood. Next slide. And uh, the reason, what are the legal things what I was mentioning is the right to die with dignity is a fundamental right as already declared by the constitution bench judgment of the court. And uh, also we declare that an adult human being having mental capacity, whoever is clear, has the right to take an informed decision, has right to refuse medical treatment, 
and also they can make a decision on withdrawal from life service like like as i said no uh, withdrawing from resuscitation life saving devices nowadays you have defibrillator so many things implanted so someone can make a decision i don't want all that and document means we have to listen to their wish okay an adult human being of conscious mind is fully entitled to refuse medical treatment or to decide not to take medical treatment and may decide to embrace death in a natural way see everyone may not want to go into icu and we can't force oh you are unwell you have to get admitted no one has that right so if the patient has already made some informed decision we have to give due respect not only due respect we have to make sure that happens the way the patient wants because that is also your duty okay next slide so and uh, i did mention about advanced medical directive or living will is exactly what is written ahead and kept and uh, everything is very clearly mentioned in that and in january 2023 in india also this has been very legally made so it's like elders who are in a situation who want to make any decision like that we should inform them what are the possibilities guide them direct them to make or implement their wish what they want to do. next slide so what is living will it's a legal document it's created by the patient what all does it have explaining and documenting their wishes about medical treatment if and when they become incompetent or unable to communicate due to terminal illness dementia is a very common and nice example which you can give okay many don't know because dementia still what is causing how is it causing it's a we know that vascular insufficiency is there but suddenly they may get to a stage and then they may be like that for some time so anticipating that someone can make a decision and write and keep everything because when i become like that i may not be able to make a decision if i don't know who i am I, who am i how will i make a decision so that is what is done at, in advance in the living will okay this main important thing is this helps the medical professional and family on the type of medical care someone would wish this is something important everyone needs to know about it in the first place so that first is for each one to know and next one is to impart to people who may benefit from it and who have that will and wish to do so can be guided appropriately next slide so in india there are plenty of professional bodies who are entitled for all this there are many documents and palium also palium website has all these information on this advance will writing document everything is there you can see in the website and it is done not by one man okay so there is no bias in it it is a team of uh, physician neurologists and uh, big team of legal team everyone together only makes a guideline on all these important uh, topics and so everyone could confidently follow for themselves for their patients and everything and any clarifications all these documents which are mentioned have enough information when you read and see and palim website also has uh, the information on what is needed for this so we it's it's not a single person's decision so when it is the decision made by many people no uh, all the pros and cons and benefits risk everything is considered and only then it is made so no one needs to have any uh, bias or query has this been done well done appropriately so all those um, myth whatever is there can be ruled out very wisely so with that i think we'll finish and then anyone who has queries can ask and then like not only we, like in the whole topic uh, anything you would like me to clarify
Anybody wants to ask anything? If you have any doubts, you can use the chat box or you can unmute yourself. Any query or any sharing you want to share about your area, what you're facing? Is it a new topic or anything? Anything that uh, like we can also understand that what you you what you have uh, like seen in this all slide you have understood or not? Any anything you can share it. Some of you mentioned that you already work in palliative care. At least few of few of the uh, participants, right? Because you could have had uh, like some similar cases uh, where this, whether this is right or not, dilemma, dilemma, whether to go ahead and do it this way, or if I don't do, is it better? Or if I don't do, will, they, will that cause harm? So those are the things which normally you will be facing. So anything like that, any uh, situations you want to share, you could. Okay, I think uh, the session was very, uh, almost clear and uh, very informative. So that's why you don't have any doubt. So, okay, so then uh, we will end the session. Um, if so ever you have any doubt, so you can uh, type in the WhatsApp chat and we will revert back. So thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much, ma'am, for taking yes, such an informative session. As she mentioned only, see, sometimes even if you don't have any queries now, you can uh, get back to us and we can clarify your doubts, if so. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. That was a wonderful and informative session. Thank you, Mr. Skandala, for the presentation. Thank you also all for joining. Thank you. Let's see in the next section. Bye.